make weight with the overseer who's itching to beat him. Look, I'm Cheers. Oh, here you go. <laughs> I'm gonna walk right up to the White House, kick down the door, steal the Constitution of Independence, and grab Abraham Lincoln and tell him he can't have it back until he writes the Emancipation Proclamation. So help me God, or my name is it Scarlett Johansson. How does it best? Hey, Nicole, NicoleNichelle.com. Um, if you're wondering, I came here in my true form to pay homage to the remarkable, the incomparable, the one and only Prince. Um, you will be missed. And yeah, so I just wanted to do that quickly. And in the comments, just tell me the Prince song that changed your life or a significant moment you had when you encountered a Prince, well, when you first heard Prince. So let's just get into it. This week, um, I, this is something I really wanted to do for a while, but it's really hard. Underground is trying to kill us, but it is a show that's undeniable in its uh, just in its portrayal of slavery. Um, I think every African American, every Black person, you know, is oversaturated with slave narratives. The one thing Hollywood loves most, and will get green lighted all the time, are slave narratives and biopics. So you understand my hesitance when Underground came on, but I decided to check it out even in the first episode weeks ago and was transfixed by the show. The, my intimidation was, I don't know, I, I really, it's so hard to discuss a show. It is so multifaceted. You could take one element of the show and discuss it for hours. We don't have that time, but I really can't wait to discuss this with you. And I really wanna make it more interactive um, and learn more about what you feel about Underground, WGN, and the emotions that are evoked from you when you watch it, because I think everybody pulls a different thing from it. What I'm gonna do is tell you the five-ish reasons why I love Underground and what makes it unique to me, and also just recap last week's episode. Um, one, the reason why I could even first get on board with it was because I saw the roster and I saw really great, a lot of great actors and actresses that I knew. But my number one hesitancy with slave narratives is the white savior complex. I'm gonna walk right up to the White House, kick down the door, steal the Constitution of Independence, and grab Abraham Lincoln and tell him he can't have it back until he writes the Emancipation Proclamation. So help me God, or my name is it Scarlett Johansson. One of the most raw slave narrative portrayals, like a real slave narrative that happened with Solomon Northup um, in 12 Years a Slave. Um, I think it was, it was more easily received because it kind of had this, you know, it had, you know, I love Solomon Northup because he was someone who was wrongly, he was captured and he found a way through the most terrible circumstances to get himself to freedom, concealing the fact that he could write um, and just really, and then being eventually saved by a white person. So I think that uh, made it more palatable for general audiences. And then also the slave owner in that narrative was a complete and utter masochist, evil through and through. And the one thing about Underground that stands out to me that is absolutely fantastic is it blows that out of the water. When I talk about the white savior narrative, like even the abolitionists, who are in the business of helping to free slaves, their cargo, they are flawed. And actually, I believe her name is Elizabeth. Her husband has been complicit in the institution of slavery where he used the selling of a slave to promote himself professionally. It was just that easy. So not they're not saviors through and through. They're not, they're not people who have who don't have any guilt or haven't participated in the harmful institution of slave, slavery. So that's one thing where you know all the characters are flawed and then let's get into the slave owner the Macon character um he is a terrible person he really is but he wants desperately to be liked by people he wants to be elected to office and he wants to be liked by his slaves so he while he employs the overseers to do his dirty work and is absolutely a part of their daily torture, he'll give you a bottle of whiskey for your trouble. 
The second reason why I absolutely love this narrative is that the slaves are in so intelligent. The, the slaves are what you would have to be. What would you have to be um, in order to free yourself? When you look at Frederick Douglass, who was a who freed himself from slavery. When you look at Harriet Tubman, Harriet Tubman. Oh, here you go. <laughs> was able to see freedom from slavery and then go back several times, hundreds of times, back to the South to free other slaves. What would you have to do to be someone who could beat, who could outsmart the militias um, and just the regular people around who could, who benefit from the institution of slavery? Just regular people who want a bounty, who want money, who are poor. They're not slave owners, they don't have any money, but they're white and they can turn into slaves and get $100 a head. So think of that, think about that, or $1,000 a head. So just think about that. Um, and I love that it displays the intelligence. How even songs that we sing today, um, old spirituals, they have the codes to freedom built into them. So while you think the slaves are singing in the fields, they're singing about uh, singing idly in the fields. They're singing in, a, in an aspirational way about gaining freedom. So that was a genius, ingenious way to, to get themselves uh, to freedom. And then you have the, even this, the last episode, um, the seven-year-old James tie, <laughs> knowing that if not getting weight for cotton was a perilous notion, so he sewed dirt into the bottom of his bag. The only reason I can really stomach it is that it does, it finally shows in a way that I don't think has recently been portrayed, the intelligence and the craftiness that has to go into being able to free yourself from slavery, being able to run. The main character being able to notice that, yo, the only way we're gonna get free is to work together and making a makeshift team with playing to everyone's strengths to get free. A third reason why I love it is growing up in the South, there is this antebellum fallacy, and I'm sure mo many African Americans who live in the South have been invited to at least one antebellum wedding or some type of plantation event or party. And you see, you know, people love to dress in the times and stuff like that. I don't know why you won't come to my wedding at the Macon Plantation. I think that Obama has you all riled up. It's our heritage, a remembrance of simpler times. The slave would do a little work, and in exchange they have food to eat. With a complete disregard for the terrible era that that was, and you know, and how insensitive that could be to an African American like me who had to look up, who looked up their ancestry and saw that my great, 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 great grandfather was given up as a, was given up with the candlesticks and other property for as inheritance after one master passed away, he was given up as an object um, to another plantation. You know, that's very painful. So me thinking about antebellum, that's what goes in my mind. It doesn't go through my mind lemonade and, and hoop skirts. Um, so I'm sure it, it blows that myth apart with one scene. And I think it was in one of the first episodes when they were at an antebellum party and all the women are wearing, they were at a party and all the women are wearing their hoop skirts and enjoying refreshments. And then I believe you saw little James, seven year old James in a cage hanging from the ceiling, fanning the party goers. And only one person who, who turns out, Elizabeth I believe, who turns out to be an abolitionist looks up and sees the sight of like the small black boy fanning the party goers. There were slaves in biblical times, but you don't see that. I never hear that complaints. And hell, they built the pyramids. Don't you think you should be over it by now? I was on a high last week and that was when I finally decided I'm gonna start covering underground because guess what? We're, we're, we're getting free. There's always just a glimmer of hope and there's like outside of just the, the taxing and depressing subject matter that it is, there's always just a glimmer of hope that comes with them running for freedom. So Rosalie shows up like a bouse at the end of the episode with the Native Americans who helped her out and they're flowing towards their sales towards them. I'm like, you know what? I'll, I'll start covering underground. Um, just to be bludgeoned over the head with probably the heaviest hour of television I think I've seen in in years. You have Ernestine 
explaining to James, who she was promised by Macon was not going to go on the fields, explaining to him how to have two different faces to go out and how to perform being a slave. And I'm just like, okay, so we're doing this. We're doing this. Little kid, little buddy's gonna go out in the field and become a slave, okay? I'm just gonna, all right. Okay. So now little buddy's gonna have to make weights with the overseer who's itching to beat him. Look, I'm gonna need something stronger about this. Minute. If you could excuse me for a second. Ah. Cheers. Okay, yeah, so this one, it really focused on the children, which I think was probably why it was the most powerful, and it really developed everyone's roles. It, like, James is smacked with the reality of where his station is in this world. So where he was playing with his half-brother and having fun and feeling equal, he, is, he learns quite quickly the, his status and how he's really viewed through having to slave away in the field and man, seeing that blood on that cotton, that little hand and the blood on that cotton was probably one of the hardest things ever. That was really, that was really difficult. And then let's, let's get into Kato. Kato is what, another reason why I love that show. When I saw there was a person named Kato, I thought I was gonna like him because historically, um, Hercules Mulligan, who is portrayed in Hamilton, had a slave named Kato, Kato who, um, was really awesome and a spy in the Revolutionary War, so I thought that would be something that would be cool. Um, but yeah, I don't like this Cato at all. But there are characters who there are characters who gonna live, and Cato is gonna live. Um, he he has systematically gotten rid of anyone who he sees as dead weight. And as much as you hate him, and as much as he's as crafty as he is, he's working his way on Henry this episode. He's he's just like trying to create a divide between Noah and Rosalie. He, it, as much as we like to hate him, he has been absolutely essential to where they are right now. Um, he's attacked people, he has knifed people, he has burned down the cotton fields to get them where they are. So as much as we don't like him, he has been essential to their journey as well. So just like they said, you can't work alone. He's an essential part of them moving forward. But yeah, I really want to hear what you guys think. This has been such a hard video to kind of film. It's but yeah, below, just tell me your thoughts about Underground. I just think it's a really phenomenal show. Um, <laughs> let me know if you want me to keep doing this. Again, thanks for all the views last week. I really do appreciate it. And to new subscribers, welcome to my channel. I really do appreciate all your views, all your comments. I really want to have a really great conversation about Underground. What were your thoughts on this episode? Who is your favorite character? Who do you want to die? <laughs> um, but my thing is, my, what are your theories? My theory is Kato's gonna make it to the end. There's nothing that indicates from his behavior thus far that he is not gonna make it. Uh, but yeah, and also if you have time, tell me your favorite Prince song. I'll see you guys next week.